player and co-op to Mutual Wales. And uh, to take a Euro football analogy, I think, folks, it's a game of two halves. I think we've had an exciting first half. I think there's been a few goals. And I anticipate a few more uh, close, close uh, skirmishes in the second half. Uh, probably won't end in penalties. But I think the crowd will be cheering from the sidelines as we hear some exciting uh, contributions. So straight over to the uh, Jeremy Miles, the Minister for Education and the Welsh Language, Labour and Co-op uh, member of the Senate. I'll hand over to him now. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much for that um, introduction. I, 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 I'm in awe of your ability to extend the metaphor in the way that you did. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to match that. But um, really uh, delighted to be chairing this session, uh, which um, is going to look at how we uh, raise the profile of uh, Robert Owen and uh, co-ops uh, and mutuals in Wales, and how we uh, encourage engagement with uh, the sector in all aspects of life. And I think um, particularly into perhaps, uh, given my ministerial responsibilities, in hearing how uh, we might do that in the context of education, which... Uh, Owen had some incredibly uh, progressive things to say about, and I think in many ways that move to a more kind of child-centered education policy is one that we've, um, we've which has inspired our education uh, journey in Wales during the period of uh, devolution. So I think there are some very interesting, uh, interesting lessons for us from his work. Um, uh, I, I'm one of the um, uh, co-op party uh, members of the Senate, along with uh, Mick and uh, a very large number of others, actually. And I think um, one of the things I'm proudest of, and I'm sure Mick is as well, is how the um, how co-op principles uh, and the work of the co-op movement uh, has um, uh, achieved such a voice in the work of Senate, and I, I, I would say the government as well. And I think that is uh, that it, that can be seen in the kind of policy uh, initiatives that we've developed uh, over the years, and I think you know, the growing presence of co-op members in the Senate will uh, support that to continue even further and even stronger into the future. But you didn't come to hear me speak, you came to hear our very illustrious panel, and we have three contributors, each of whom are going to give us uh, their reflections on this area before we then uh, open the discussion to the floor. So please do think about uh, the questions and points that you uh, would like to make during the uh, during the uh, remarks which each of our speakers uh, uh, is going to give. Uh, we have uh, Liz MacGyver, who uh, manages the Co-op Cooperative Heritage uh, Trust, uh, which supports the public to uh, have access to the rich uh, archive uh, and material collections and to safeguard the heritage assets of the um, co-op movement in the UK. Liz, as you will see from the short uh, biographies in your uh, paper today, has a background in uh, museums management and has worked with some of the um, leading museums in the UK. Uh, Sean Williams is the head of special collections uh, and librarian for the South Wales Miners Library, um, which is at Swansea University, as colleagues will know. Um, and Sean uh, is responsible as well for the development of the Richard Burton archives, uh, the Miners Library, rare books and history of computing collection and the art collection as well at Swansea University, um, and has a significant track record in community and collaborative projects in this space, um, and perhaps very directly related to this discussion, curated uh, an exhibition on uh, Robert Owen's legacies um, uh, about 10 years ago, I think. Um, uh, Dr. Sarah Vicari uh, is a researcher in the uh, space of uh, cooperatives and the, their role in uh, sustainable development, sustainable human development, brings a, an international perspective to uh, the discussion today, was co-founder, uh, as I'm sure some colleagues will know, of Around the World Co-op, um, and uh, has travelled extensively internationally, uh, documenting uh, the work of uh, and the innovations of cooperatives in different parts of the world. So um, a rich uh, tapestry of influences and experiences to share this morning. Um, and I'll ask, please, if Liz, whether you would kick us off. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm happy to do that. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I have a few slides, so I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. Uh, there we 
we go. So you should be able to see that hopefully. Um, so thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm looking at, you know, kind of Owen's legacy and the co-op movement um, in Wales related to our collection, um, what we hold at the Cooperative Archive, which, as you said, is part of the Cooperative Heritage Trust. And the trust was formed in 2007. So we're, we're still quite a new organisation, relatively, uh, as an independent charity to bring collections together in the face of possible loss. Um, and Owen's correspondence forms part of that collection. It was originally collected by George Jacob Holyoke, who became known later as the first cooperative historian. And it was deposited with his own writings after his death with the Cooperative Union uh, based in Manchester. So what I want to really look at is Welsh records uh, partly in this and the, what I've called the gap of nations, because I think that in the way that we tell the cooperative story, we don't always tell it, um, if you like, from that perspective, from the perspective of having different nation identities. And that's, of course, no doubt, partly because of the cooperative movement's ethos in looking at the whole in a holistic approach, which is, of course, what Robert Owen was um, an exponent of. Um, but I want I'm interested in Welsh records. I want to make the link between Owen and the cooperative movement. It's not always the easiest thing to do. And trying to do a Welsh cooperative history is quite challenging for various reasons. But we are keen to explore um, ways of doing that and ways of engaging new audiences so we particularly as we look forward to collecting new material in the future to tell the whole co-op story so i'm going to start with we talked about owen as an influencer but there are other influences and influencers at the time um, he's not the only one of course uh, dr william king who's uh, on this slide here also wrote about the establishment of effectively cooperative societies and although he had a very different take on it to Owen they were both social influences of their time through what they said and what they wrote and how people responded to that um, some of the Rochdale pioneers themselves were described as Owenites um, before establishing their cooperative and I'd hoped today to be talking to you from their original cooperative store in Rochdale but due to coronavirus which is why I'm not there and I'm at home um, but it's partly due to the success of the retail um, provision of the retail model that there's a disconnect in the minds of people when it comes to Robert Owen and what they see as the cooperative movement now you know that there is still a tendency amongst the wider public who maybe don't know very much about Robert Owen or the cooperative movement to see them as dis, you know as disconnected um as cooperatives being about making money or being about retail being about provision of services uh, rather than a cultural understanding um he's a better known figure robert owen in in other places for example he's particularly well known in japan and in in the usa uh, partly because of the new harmony model but also because of it, the understanding about him being a father of the cooperative movement in the agricultural sector. Um, so he's less well known in Mid Wales, where he came from. Um, and of course, you know, this idea of his writings, I think, which Chris has already talked about this morning, being around how how change can take place in a strict class hierarchy in in Britain. Um, and how how ideas that Owen had might be used in a more practical framework by other people. And of course, we know that there were inconsistencies with the way that Owen lived and the relationships he had. And of course, those natural allies he might have had at the time didn't always see things the same way that he did. But of course, that's true of modern influences as well. You know, whether they're social media, whether they're football players, you know, that there are a lot of negative and um, critical voices so I know that obviously that is something that Owen would have had to cope with in his lifetime. And that's that's understandable because you can never take everybody on board with you. Um, but really, I suppose, looking at the message. The idea of knowledge and union, taking that from the cooperator being powerful, you know, that the sharing of ideas gives power. By the time Robert Owen became involved at New Lanark, um, 
to make a comparison between New Lanark and Manchester, which where of course a lot of Owen's experience was gained. The regions are similar in Owen's time as trade production and distribution hubs. So they're, they're, they're hubs of power as well. And I suppose what he's faced with in New Lanark, as well as in Manchester, is a problem directly related to social and economic disruption. So we might be tempted if we were going to transplant our modern selves back into the early 1800s to call that a new normal, you know, to use um, current parlance. Workers in both places, in Manchester and New Lanark, are, if you like, the first generation to spend their whole working lives in purpose-built factories and purpose-built new communities outside the traditional, you know, village context, rural context. And that cultural shift, it categorises what we now understand to be the industrial age. It's a change in behaviours that happen so quickly that people don't know how to fully respond to them and it creates not only problems, but also new solutions and new ways of, of, of resolving some of these problems. It's very difficult, of course, to get other industrialists, other people to accept ideas like performance management, the rights of workers, um, the rights of the person, you know, the need for education, environmentalism. Never in places like Manchester and, and, and in Glasgow, never mind places like rural Wales. So it's not surprising in some ways that Owen's message or Owen's legacy is less, um, less understood, perhaps in Wales. And I've, I've used this slide because I want to talk a little bit about, if you like, about co-ops in Wales, sort of leading on from Owen. Um, George Hawkins wrote an essay in 1892 about cooperation in South Wales. And I've not shared a picture of the essay because it's very very boring, there are no pictures in it. Um, but he was the chair of CWS's London branch, the Cooperative Wholesale Society. And effectively, the essay is a bit of a, it's a bit of a pressure point and a love letter to CWS and to federation and unionisation. And in it, he's quite, quite, quite controversially, he accuses South Welsh cooperative managers of not being very cooperative. And he says things like that they're allowing credit lines, which is not, um, you know, not a cooperative practice and that individual managers are trying to effectively be capitalists by using their influence to increase their means beyond their salaries. That's the, the, the words that he uses. And what he, he says in this um, essay is he pleads for these South Welsh cooperators to put their house in order. You know, they're the words he uses and to be better cooperators. And this is, let's not forget, a message from England. It's not a message from Wales or a message to Welsh people. And the more subtle take on it today might be, you know, the, the strap line of International Cooperatives Day, which is today, rebuild better together. How better to work together for mutual um, benefit without losing your own sense of identity or the way that you do things. Um, but Hawkins's uh, text is much more hard hitting than that, much less subtle. And what he puts it down to is he says that around £300,000 is lost through poor cooperation, which could be used for the benefit of local people in charity or educational opportunities. So he's basing that on Glamorgan, cooperative, um, sort of the cooperative surplus, if you like. He's saying that in, in, co in cooperatives in Glamorgan, there's over half a million pounds is available through those cooperatives. So they're a really powerful force, potentially, compared to in Carmarthenshire, uh, only netting about £3,000 that year. And he, he doesn't talk about the difference in experience between South Wales and North Wales. What he's trying to do is harness the power of, or the, if you like, the spending power, the power of dividend of the South Welsh communities, much more heavily populated, more industrialised, to come into the union, to be part of the cooperative union, to be part of the national um, approach to the movement. So that's what that essay is really about. Um, but that, you know, what it shows you is that there is a difference in the Welsh experience at the time in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, the way cooperative societies work, what happens to them is different. Um, and particularly 
where in rural Wales and mid Wales, you know, there's a, a, a strong sort of ethos around community cooperatives, particularly in remote places where membership offers more than just a dividend. It offers, you know, opportunity to do other things. And it's in a similar demographic to what you might see in rural parts of Scotland, where those independent societies hang on for a really long time before becoming merged with cooperative retail society and um, eventually the CWS, which is now the cooperative group. Um, until the 1940s, a great, and a great shift away from land-based employment, that, that was you know, a fairly sort of stable setup. But when farming could no longer support large populations and retail habits and social habits and economic uh, habits changed, that's when you see a big shift nationally all over the country away from cooperative membership. And in those unliquidated societies, particularly in North Wales, what you now see is that those are cooperative group premises, often in the same, you know, the original society buildings. Um, and I think there's a tendency when we're trying to tell the story of always focusing on the bigger part of that story, on the, if you like, the, you know, the sort of major partners on ev effectively cooperative, cooperative group, because those are the most visible uh, signs. So in placement of co-op stores in North Wales, you now see in places like Ruthin or Landroost, Bangor, Machantleth, um, Lanferpurgungel, I'm not going to say the whole word, <laughs> Uh, my pronunciation won't be great, but those are the places that still have, um, if you like, at the centre of community, the cooperative, OK, the cooperative group, but would originally have had a very rich uh, individual and localised society and membership base. So, you know, what does that say for cooperative identity in Wales? You know, it's and the visibility of heritage, because we've got Robert Owen but he's he obviously he's better known elsewhere so how can we sort of connect that how can we sort of go back to the roots of co-op identity and history and celebrate it bearing in mind it's so invisible in some cases um I just wanted to share this photograph from a cooperative survey that was undertaken in the in the early 20th century and this picture of Catherine Maurer near Wrexham, the new premises in 1901. And I think until very recently, it was called the Wheat Sheaf Workshops. It was used for community purposes. But why I wanted to share this picture, and it's a very grainy picture, is because uh, one of the items that we have in our collection is this textile banner, which shows the building when it was newly built. And I think is, is a really nice way of linking back to the physical heritage to the built environment. And that building, of course, is still at the centre of that district, is still there. It may not be being used for the same purposes, but I think these are the things that can make those connections. So why was that building important to that community? Why did they invest the money in a new and modern premises and modern architecture? And what could it mean for the future? And basically, how can we use our collections to be part of that, to tell, to sort of tell that story? and to be meaningful to people in those places now. And I'm just going to use a, a slightly more contemporary photograph, and it's not very contemporary, it's from the mid 80s, um, of Tinued um, Community Pub as it was then. It's no longer a community cooperative. Uh, now the pub is still there near Pavelli. Um, but I wanted to use this because this was an example in the 80s of capturing the new wave of cooperatives so community cooperatives worker cooperatives and why I chose this is because we have seen particularly recently an ex mass exodus from those north and mid Wales communities of young people people with skills and ambition because they don't have employment or they don't have opportunity they can't get housing in those communities so I think that this is still an example of a model that can be used to pivot to new markets it's still a useful model it's still something that you know perhaps is a solution um when a community needs to be self-reliant needs to provide its own services so community pubs aren't a new idea but there are lots and lots of ways in which the cooperative model and if you like owen's ideas about making 
a community um, a more sustainable place for especially for young people and how to harness education as part of that so I think that there is a future for that but what we need to do is to fill in the gap that people especially young people don't see this don't understand this and don't see the sort of wealth if you like of the last two centuries of cooperative practice particularly in Wales so that's a gap we need to fill but I'd like to stop sharing at this stage and um, yeah it's it's just some ideas basically but I'm going to I'm going to pose a question to the floor we want to be able to use our collections not just uh, Owen's correspondence but all of our collections and the ones that we will continue to build on to work together in that kind of loose mutual um, culture that Wales is so famous for to to try to sort of do our part in filling in that gap of education and cooperative culture. So I'm going to leave the question, how can we do that more effectively in partnership with other organisations? Thank you. Liz, thank you very much for that. And thank you also for um, devising the question for us to discuss later, which is very helpful. I'm really keen that we come back to that idea of how we can use our experiences and our heritage, which illustrates that, to uh, um, you know, stimulate and re-inspire people on that kind of community level cooperative. I think we can come back to that in the in the discussion. But thank you for a really interesting uh, discussion there. Um, I will now ask uh, Sean Williams to share her thoughts. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. I will. I have a few slides, so I shall just um, share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the exhibition um, Robert Owen Legacies That Last um, that I curated in 2008 now to mark the 150th anniversary of uh, Robert Owen's death, working alongside colleagues um, in the Robert Owen Network. Um, but first of all, I just thought it might be helpful just to, I'm picking up a little bit on, on what Liz was saying, thought it might be helpful to just briefly outline some of the resources that we have at Swansea University for those that are interested in studying um, cooperative history or heritage. So our collections are held at the South Wales Miners Library, the picture at the top, and the Richard Burton Archives. And um, I will just say at this point, I am a librarian. I'm not a historian of the, the co-op movement in any shape or form. We have um, a collection and our collection of co-op material is just one of many collections that we hold which document the social, political, cultural and educational history of industrial South Wales. So my talk is very much coming from the position of a deep-seated interest in these collections, but how we provide access to them, how we best provide access to, to all. So the collections that we have relating to the co-op um, movement date from the early 70s, when the history department at Swansea University obtained funding to undertake the Coalfield History Project. Um, and during that project, four researchers scoured South Wales Coalfield looking for all manner of documents and photographs from the trade union movement, miners institutes and welfare halls. Um, and they collected banners, they collected oral history interviews. Uh, and as a result of this, um, we have quite a, a large collection at both the South Wales Miners Library and in the Richard Burton archives. And at the time, the South Wales Miners Library was set up as a result of this project as a centre for research. During the project, records from the Aberdare and District, Ammonford, Britain Ferry and Neath and Tom Pentra Industrial Cooperative Societies were collected, including minute books, account books, rules, rule books. Uh, material was also deposited by individuals involved in the cooperative movement, such as Abel Morgan of Venisable and Alistair Wilson of Aberdare. 
The collections that we have are split, as I've mentioned, between the, the Miners Library and the Richard Burton Archives. So the minute books, the letters, the photographs are in the Richard Burton Archives, while the printed collections, oral histories, are held at the um, South Wales Miners Library. Since the, co uh, the Coalfield History Project in the 1970s, the cooperative group have deposited many more records from cooperative societies um, across South Wales, including a large collection which was deposited in 2007. This collection covers the mid 19th century to the early um, 21st century and in, it includes administrative and financial records um, of cooperative cooperative societies, as well as correspondence, press cuttings, society histories, um, tokens, copper printing blocks, and material published by the cooperative movement, such as on education. We, for example, have lesson notes from the Cooperative Union Education Department, uh, which were courses run in 1940 to 1955. We've also got um, copies of pamphlets produced by the Member Relations Office uh, in Swansea. And I think it is very much thanks to the foresight of those working in those office, much, such as Roger Davis, who um, I, I worked alongside, um, that much of this material was created and in fact original documentation and records from the societies were deposited with us at Swansea University and, and do still exist. So the variety of the documents that are found within the collection is particularly apparent with the example of Aberdare and District Cooperative Society. And you will note on the screen there is um, an image from Home magazine of, of a typical image, I, I would like to think, of Aberdare. Um, in addition to um, copies of Home magazine. There are minute books from the late 20th century and lots of other um, written material, including balance sheets from 1872, various papers regarding the staff of the society, such as a reference for Edward Harris, who was the baker, a selection of speeches given at annual staff re reunions in the 1950s and notes and histories of the society, as well as I've, I've already mentioned um, copies of Wheat Sheaf and Home Magazine, which were issued by Aberdare and District Cooperative Society between um, 1898 and 1963 are the dates that we have in our collection. We've not had huge amounts of um, archival material deposited with us since. However, at the South Wales Miners Library, we have consciously been trying to expand our collection of printed material relating to the cooperative movement, really to provide context to the um, archival material which has been deposited. And in addition to, to copies of some of the well-known publications by Cole and, and Holyoke, we've got, uh, we have collected um, a more specialist reference collections with histories of local cooperative societies, national reports, directories and um, periodicals. And in recent years, I've been very grateful to the National Cooperative Archive for depositing duplicate copies of cooperative news and other publications, which means that researchers based in South Wales particularly no, not, no longer need to visit the National Library of Wales or, or Manchester to access these. They are available to view at the South Wales Miners Library. And this is perhaps um, a source of further collaboration between us in the future. Um, we have catalogued the collection and um, it is available to, the catalogue at least is available to view online, but we have tried to do some interpretation. And this is an example, the Coalfield Web Materials website that we produced um, many years ago. Um, we have 
attempted to do some interpretation, at least of some of the collections that we hold. And there are some images to some of the photographs and other materials that are held in our collections as well. So in around 2007, around the time that we had this large deposit from the cooperative group, a steering group was set up at Swansea University with the intention of promoting research into the history of the cooperative movement in South Wales. Um, and as part of these initiatives, I was invited to join the Robert Owen Network, which is made up of the cooperative group, the Robert Owen Society, the Robert Owen Museum, Cooperatives and Mutuals Wales, and many others, to plan events to mark the 150th anniversary of the death of Robert Owen. And I will now just talk a little bit about the um, exhibition that was produced as a result of that. So many of the events that were organised centred on Newtown, including a lecture by a certain Professor Chris Williams, which was held in, in 2008. There were also other events like a family fun day. Um, the local schools were involved and um, one of the local schools put on a play. Um, for example, and it, it was a very collaborative process. But one of the activities um, was to create an exhibition, an exhibition which could tour Wales and look at how we got um, the message about Robert Owen and about the cooperative um, group and the cooperative movement more generally out to the public. So I was fortunate enough to receive funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Welsh Government to curate um, a physical and an online exhibition and Robert Owen Legacies That Last um, was, the, uh, was the result. And um, the quote which is on the screen, I gave important truths to the world and it was for only for the only for the want of understanding that they were disregarded. I have been ahead of my time. That was um, really um, the starting point for the exhibition. And um, I'm very grateful to both the Robert Owen Museum and the National Co Cooperative Archive for their support and in enabling me to access their materials to, to create the exhibition. So using quotations from Owen's writings and speeches that he'd given, the exhibition explored some of the issues that Owen had been addressing at the time of the Industrial Revolution, such as education, living conditions, social responsibility, fair trade and environment. Each theme was explored on a pull-up banner as much as you can explore a theme in a hundred words on a pull-up banner. Um, but this was the, the, um, the exhibition panels that, that were produced and the pull-up banners were actually produced and printed on cotton fabric as a, a nod to Owen's cotton mills. We wanted the exhibition to be portable, hence it was on pull-up banners. And we wanted the banners to be able to stand alone singly, as well as form a larger um, exhibition, um, depending on space available. In the spirit of lifelong learning, we wanted the panels to be accessible to adults as well as children. So the bottom part of the banner posed questions aimed at our younger visitors. There was also a spot the difference um, on, the, on the logos across the bottom of the, the screen, which proved very popular with all. So the exhibition was officially opened at the Senedd on the 21st of February 2008, and then it went touring around Wales. Its first port of call being Newtown Library, where um, photographs um, with members of the Robert Owen network and some young, young people enjoying the exhibition uh, were taken. <clears throat> we wanted to provide a range of creative and interesting resources alongside the exhibition, which both schools and could use, but also could be used within 
the exhibition space. And apologies for the quality of the photograph, but this is um, one of the photographs I took in um, while it was on tour around Wales. So we have the panels. We also have Robert Owen's traveling trunk, which um, traveled with the exhibition. And it um, contained a variety of resources from cooperative board games to jigsaws to facsimiles of letters written by Owen, a replica of the silent monitor that Chris referred to earlier and various worksheets. But the exhibition did not just travel to museums and libraries. Here it is in a field at the Toll Puddle Martyrs Festival in 2008. And rather than having the large traveling trunk, we have a small traveling trunk which contained the games and the coloring and, and so on. Um, but it was an opportunity to get the exhibition out to as many people as possible. The online version of the exhibition um, contained the, the text of the exhibition, but it also in a little bit more detail, but it also contained downloadable resources for teachers and learners. And it provided a timeline with key events to Owen's life and contemporary events to provide that context and to explain a little bit more about the, the time at which Owen lived and worked. Some of the downloadable resources um, are, are on the screen. Um, but we also provided copies of these in the traveling trunk so that people could fill them in while looking around the exhibition, but also so that they could be used in schools as well. And um, everything that we produced was bilingual. I worked with an educational consultant to produce the teacher's resource pack and we wanted to ensure that it linked in with the curriculum and particularly we aimed it at citizenship, history, art, literacy and IT. The resource pack provided um, the, the the exhibition text and also an outline of Owen's life and ideals and it also then looked at six key themes New Lanark, New Lanark School, Factories, New Harmony, Trades Unions and Legacies That Last. We worked with local authority education officers across Wales to publicise the resource and encourage schools to, to go and look at the exhibition while it was in that area. Schools certainly in Newtown went to visit it, but it, it was difficult in other areas to, to encourage um, schools to actually go and visit the exhibition. But website statistics showed that the resource was accessed, but perhaps not as much as we would have liked. And I think this is perhaps something that we would we could explore a little bit further. How do we how do we in museums, libraries, archives work more closely with teachers? How do we get them to use resources um, that we have created? How do we work together? To, to create them, to, to provide resources that, that will actually be used. The exhibition is now um, 13 years old um, and it is still occasionally used. The trail sheets, the um, interactive resources are also used, but the website is now archived. And given it's the 250th anniversary of his birth, I think now is the time and I'm very keen to revisit the exhibition and the resources that we produced. We have a digital platform at Swansea University that we have just started using, which I'm keen to, to use to, to rejuvenate the digital online exhibition. But with changes in the curriculum, um, the teacher and resource, I'm fully aware, needs a complete review and complete rethink. And um, but I think it would be perhaps a useful starting point um, for others to work with us. And I would 
be very, very keen to work collaboratively with others to explore how we can make um, the resource and the work that has been done, not only by ourselves, but by others on Robert Owen and the cooperative movement more generally accessible to, um, to lifelong learners. Thank you. Sean, Sean, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. And just to, uh, the wealth of material in that exhibition is just is incredibly impressive. As you were going through it, I was just thinking of there must be an opportunity to, to, to reintroduce people to this material. So I'm really glad that you ended with what you did. I think um, there's a very exciting opportunity there, isn't there, to, to extend the reach of it to, to new audiences on an ongoing basis. And maybe we can come back and talk about that um, in, in the discussion. So thank you very much for that. Um, and the third of our three uh, panellists is uh, Dr. Sarah Vicari, and I'll ask you, Sarah, to take over from here. Thank you. I have some slide too, so let me just share. Okay, here we are. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me again to share some reflection. Um, and today, Particularly, let me wish you all a, a happy International Cooperative Day. Um, and I'm happy to share some insights about uh, how we can reveal better together in the spirit of uh, Owen. Um, so let me just uh, start about what uh, is uh, under everyone's eyes. So we all know that our planet uh, is facing challenges in terms of environmental, social, uh, economic crisis. Um, and the situation has got worse uh, with the pandemic. Um, the uh, achievement in, by 2030 of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals now is becoming uh, more uh, difficult. And we, as an um, international cooperative movement, as an international cooperative family, we are called upon uh, rebuilding the society uh, together. And um, so cooperatives are identified as a possible answers to uh, many challenges. But uh, uh, I would like to make immediately a link uh, uh, with the conclusion of the fantastic um, uh, lecture of uh, Chris Williams. When at the conclusion, he said uh, that one of the most important legacy that we have from uh, uh, Robert Owen is that, uh, is convinced that there are no barriers to our imagination to shape society, to change society. And this, in fact, I mean, uh, I think this, we can consider this as a main uh, legacy that we bring when uh, we have to think about how it's not only uh, the fact of rebuilding, but how we want to rebuild, reimagine the society. So how brave we have to uh, identify how cooperatives can really contribute and can continue contributing to shaping society. And uh, this, I do agree, um, I uh, remember Liz at a certain moment said that uh, there is uh, this understanding of cooperatives uh, more linked to uh, retailer sector and uh, perhaps making money. So there's too much focus on what cooperatives do. Uh, but uh, the key point about ident identity is on uh, who actually is the members, so who actually are uh, the person that are carrying out that uh, endeavor and how they are doing, uh, and most of all, why they are doing what they're doing. And I think this is so important because uh, in many countries in the world, there are still uh, many uh, misconceptions, misunderstanding of what a cooperative is, starting from confusion uh, with uh, perhaps uh, with a charity, an NGO, uh, an association, or uh, a social enterprise. So what actually a cop is? And, um, and most of all, if we think about it, the leaders of the future so will be our, our youngsters. We have to consider, and there are many uh, journals, uh, uh, scientific publications that say that cooperatives disappear from textbooks. And this is, uh, uh, this is an issue. While uh, one of the advantages of the movement is really that we can learn from each other, and this is key if we want to foster innovation and we want to, you know, as a, uh, again, uh, thinking about in the spirit of Owen, so reimagine society. Um, so just to share briefly our story for those uh, uh, who doesn't um, 
uh, don't know how about us. So um, basically, around the world, uh, uh, is a project uh, carried out in partnership with the International Cooperative Alliance. And uh, we started in 2019, and uh, we travel around the world. And our idea was exactly to catch this essence of cooperatives uh, around uh, worldwide in every sector. And, um, and catch, document the innovation. So at the end, uh, we managed to uh, document 15 cooperatives. There are 15 cooperative uh, video stories available. And our products are the result of a combination of participatory action research and video making. So where actually the cooperators are the key protagonists in telling and these stories and deciding how to tell their own story. And when we came back, of course, I mean, after being exposed to such fantastic stories, we could not uh, um, build our own collective. So now we are a collective of six people and we are continuing uh, doing this and working on these areas. Um, so our video stories, of course, are all available. They're open source. They're all available on YouTube. And uh, I encourage you, of course, to use them uh, in uh, any of your activities. But uh, what I would like to focus today is uh, what we learned during this trip uh, from the youngsters. Uh, they were, they, we had very inspirational uh, meetings with them. Um, let me start with uh, um, member, um, members of a school cop in Malaysia. So uh, students from between the age of 14 and 17. Um, where they actually told us something very interesting that, of course, they don't know what they will be doing in life, uh, but uh, the fact that they've been exposed to cooperative values and principles since the early age will always be part of them. So they will be citizen inspired by those values. That I think if we were, again, if we link to the uh, Owen spirit, how to reimagine the society, we are, first of all, building, uh, uh, they are, first of all, uh, conscious citizens uh, beyond being cooperators. Um, and another very important insight comes from a young cooperator from uh, Brazil, um, from a remote uh, village in the forest. She had the opportunity to study until uh, university, so she graduated. And um, her father, mother, uh, so her parents and grandpas were a member of the cooperative that is in the village. And so thanks to them, she managed to uh, go to the university. But very most interesting is what she said. She now wants, uh, and she just joined the cooperative because she wants to bring and give back what uh, the opportunity she had to the community and bring her knowledge. And I go now to the third, actually, key aspect, because this also was an insight that came from cooperators in Nepal. Uh, what they say that we, as a young members, uh, we are drivers of innovation. We have the IT skills, we have knowledge, we are, can be the protagonist of how to innovate and change our community. Um, another key aspect is about, uh, uh, comes from a young woman uh, from a Moroccan cooperative, where she told us that for her, being a cooperative was an opportunity to change her mindset but also of uh, her husband, of her parents. So it's really now she is experiencing this change in her life. And now she's herself uh, the change maker in our community for the other women. And finally, uh, another key insights that come from a young member from a worker uh, cooperative in uh, uh, California. When, she's, when he told us that uh, uh, being the cop for him uh, is really understanding that uh, there's no need to be a millionaire to be an entrepreneur. And uh, particularly that uh, it's not just being an entrepreneur, but being the cooperative means to have a say every day in the cop decision. So it's a completely different way of being an entrepreneur. Um, so just some food for thought. I mean, uh, uh, if we think about uh, these experiences, um, and if we again uh, make the link with what uh, Owen, uh, uh, the interest of Owen in a field work, uh, in, a, in a being exposed to others' uh, um, uh, knowledge, practical knowledge, so how is important really to expose and support the pupils and students, even uh, um, adults actually, uh, to um, other experiences uh, and to feel that they can be uh, the change makers. So they can be the protagonist of reimagining a new society. And um, again, looking at also being inspired about what others uh, are doing. Uh, 
Um, and yes, of course, I mean, again, uh, we uh, put on the table uh, our, our videos, because if you consider them as being inspirational learning material. Uh, also because to learn, we know that it's very important to be emotionally engaged, first of all. And uh, through these videos, it's like now with the pandemic, we learn how difficult it is to travel. Now it's more difficult than ever, but uh, this is an opportunity anyway to engage directly with the protagonist of collective stories uh, around the world and can be an opportunity to stimulate the imagination of students. So very happy of this collaboration that we uh, that started in May. Uh, I want to thank the Cops and Mutual Wales uh, for involving us in this fantastic uh, process. And of course, we remain uh, at your disposal to continue uh, the conversation. Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you very, very much for that. And it's um, really inspiring to see the kind of international perspective on this and the, um, and the role of young people's voices in some of the um, developments that you were saying in particular. I think it will be interesting for the discussion we're, we're going to have in a moment. So thank you very much to our three speakers for bringing very different perspectives to the set of challenges. Um, there are some questions in the chat, which I'll make sure that we've covered in the discussion that follows. Um, what I thought was I might put a, pose a question to each of the um, speakers, if I might. Uh, obviously, if other speakers want to give their reflections as well, that's obviously fine, but don't feel that you need to. And then I'll put some questions to the panel more broadly based on what is coming up in the, in the, in the chat. Um, so Liz, if I can start with uh, you. Um, you. There was a discussion, and you, you you were reminding us of the uh, of the uh, role of uh, you know, technology and innovation. I suppose is what we would describe it today in the workplace that um, uh, that typified the work of um, of Robert Owen. Um, and Chris is asking a question specifically about um, what evidence or uh, record do we have of the um, the reflections and reactions of uh, the workers to the conditions in which they were uh, living and I guess um, the reason I think that's a really interesting question is that we are living in an age ourselves aren't we of great technological change which will very very significantly transform the workplace in ways which are you know positive and negative um, and it seems to me very very often um, that debate is conducted as a sort of macroeconomic debate and not one which engages the experience of workers in whether some aspects of that are positive or negative for them. So just wondered what light you could throw on that. Wow, absolutely. I think um, one of the difficulties as a historian is taking a balanced view based on the, the words or the thoughts or, or reactions of ordinary people who don't get recorded. I mean, I think that's a, a fair point because even amongst our, record, our various recorded sources, whether they come from our collections or a myriad of other you know, um, libraries, archives. The problem is that we we tend to get the working class person's opinion in the context of the writer who's not not the person who's saying it. So in the context of somebody trying to make an argument either for or against. So, for example, if you're looking at the implementation of new technology in purpose built factories in, say, in, say, Manchester, the northwest and Scotland, um, and obviously later on in places like South Wales, then, you know, you get polar arguments between people who are pro this new technology and people who are against it. And while there are working class voices in that mix, they're outweighed by middle class merchants, industrialists, social reformers. But of course, social reformers who use the, you know, selected voices to support their arguments. So we know that even though we have we do have access to some uh, original opinion, it's coloured very much by the person who's who's formulating the argument, even in the case of Owen. So I think for reaction sort of reaction to implementation of technology, what we're forced to look at as well is where technology is implemented and how quickly it spreads and which regions it spreads to. So, for example, we we know because of newspaper reports and things like that, that there are in certain places more sustained um, responses, reactions, riots to the implementation of new technology, particularly where it's an it's an a rural context. So you don't tend to see it as much in an established, um, almost an you know a sort of early urbanising centre like Manchester. 
but you do absolutely see it in rural communities and hamlets in West Yorkshire. So that's, I think, but if, again, you know, it, it's, there's just not enough evidence available from those, those people, from their own point of view. And very rarely do we find, you know, pamphlets and even things like protest banners being, you know, being secretively kept, you know, or sort of banners for trades unions or that kind of, you know, those kinds of organisations. Because, of course, by their very nature, they are, you know, dangerous things to have. So, you know, in most cases, they don't survive. And where they do, they're very rare examples. So I think to compare it to a modern, a modern context, I was asked this question by somebody just yesterday about the proposed bringing in, if you like, uh, from Transport for London of completely automated you know, card payment systems, so to get rid effectively of the prepaid Oyster card. So the idea of, of that being, if you get rid of a prepaid Oyster card, you get rid of the people that are needed to put cash payment onto that Oyster card, you get rid of the sort of customer service desk at the tube station. You know, you don't, you don't have a person, you just have, a, you just have an app, you just have an automated service. And the obvious benefits for that are, are there in that things are faster, they're cleaner, they're safer, you know, there's less reliance on cash for the majority of the users who can afford the system. But what that then does do, of course, the, you know, the flip side of that is for the people who are on, you know, very low incomes, who perhaps rely on a cash, still rely on a cash economy, hand to mouth existence, it's, you know, it sort of takes those people out of the the legal framework for using that transport system. So they'd be forced to, as Owen rightly said himself, forced into a situation where they cannot use that service or they have to do it illegally. They're forced into a situation of crime. And most people do not want to, to do things that way. Most people want to be law-abiding citizens and want to have agency. So I think that's a perfect example in the modern world how technology is both a great thing and puts people at a massive disadvantage. I think that's fascinating. And I think as well, in a sense, that's one of, I, I suspect that's one of the underexplored dimensions of COVID as well, isn't it? With a, with a move to cashless transactions from a, from a public health perspective. I think that's a dimension which hasn't had the focus it might have there. I guess what you're saying is that, you know, there's a challenge to us, isn't there? That, you know, the, the idea of kind of voice and participation, which is at the heart of cooperative principles, may not you know perhaps for historical reasons have been given full potential in the in the time of owen but there's a challenge to us to make sure that we deploy those principles properly in today's challenges in the way that you're yeah responding. yeah and i think to give people i suppose to give people the the background information in order for them to make informed decisions and yeah. choices because of course owen's whole theory about in, improving people's um future prospects or future citizenry by educating them when they were young. I mean, what obviously what education looks like in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and education now, there's very different things. You know, we, we would study things in a different way. We would ask different questions. But I suppose the very fact that it's a questioning education, because if you don't get given the, if you don't get given the materials, the evidence, you don't get to debate, you don't get to pick apart a, a theory, a subject, in that way how can you ever see beyond what you've experienced so far you know that's effectively where we need to begin you know if we want our if we want our future citizens to be able to have the agency that owen wanted them to be able to have we need to be you know starting when they're really young well um our new curriculum in wales has that principle at its heart which is a, a very neat segue to the question i want to ask sean actually which is um as i said as i said when, when you were speaking sean i, I the, the theme which is occurring in my mind is how do you reintroduce people to this incredible content that you were describing and you touched to that at the end and i'm just interested in what you feel is the potential of that body of the exhibition really and the digital potential of it particularly as well um and a question that uh a question that um that, uh, that David has asked for all speakers, really, but I'll, I'll focus it on you if I may, Sean, is, you know, what can we do as cooperators? What can cooperative bodies do together, if you like, working together to make sure that we are, you know, finding the broadest audience possible for the sort of material you were describing in the exhibition? Um, 
I think there is, I think the key is, is working together. I think, you know, certainly from, um, from the uh, creating the exhibition, it's not something that necessarily we would have been able to produce or afford to produce out of our key, uh, our core um, resources, our core activities. It's something that we had to rely on funding to provide something which was um, of, a, of a quality, of a standard to involve the expertise of educational consultants, for example. Um, but I think there is a role um, as cooperators, you know, of just working together um, and perhaps taking a longer term view, not necessarily badging it on an anniversary um, or um, because that's what we've had to do or that's what we've done up until now, because that's the way that we've got the funding to be able to do these activities. I think the digital solution um, does help in some respects, although there is still a cost um, in terms of staff time, commitment, etc., in producing resources digitally. And also I'm very mindful, you know, working, um, you know, as I do with adult learners, I'm very aware of the digital divide as well. And, and we, you know, we need to make sure that we are not just exclusively providing access digitally, because that can be, um, you know, that isn't necessarily inclusive either. So I think, you know, we need to kind of think um, more broadly around the issues about how we provide access. I think also, you know, coming from a university, um, even though, you know, the, the Miners Library, for example, has worked extensively out in the community, university and university collections, I think are perceived as a little bit no-go by the, by the general public and, and perhaps by, by schools as well. So I think we need to work at how we break down the barriers to ensure that, that people feel comfortable accessing the archives the libraries and, and the museums that, that we have. But I think, you know, there's also a role in us working collaboratively with, with schools and, and with teachers. And while um, with the exhibition, I worked with an educational consultant, that was great because she was able to, to provide the insight and relate it to the curriculum in a way that I couldn't, but, the problem was still getting teachers um, to use the resource in schools. And, and I think that can only be overcome by working more collaboratively with teachers and understanding how they want to access and how they want to use our resources rather than us just kind of putting what we think they will like on our websites or, or, on, or in exhibitions. I, you know, I think that has been a, a missing link, but it's sometimes I find it, you know, very difficult to start those discussions and, uh, you know, I'm married to a teacher, you'd think I'd have an inside knowledge, but I don't, you know, getting into to talk to, to teachers um, is, is quite quite difficult and I think, you know, quite often they want things on a plate, which I understand but are so used to using the same resources time and time again, when something new is created, it's like, oh, I haven't got time to, to deal with this. Oh, I haven't got time to look at this. And I think, you know, um, having a more collaborative approach and perhaps a longer term lead in to, to all these discussions and the creation of these resources is what's, um, what might be needed. Well, I think, I think there's a challenge there for, for, for me, Sharon, as well, and for, for, for us as a kind of government to try and find ways of supporting schools to develop those channels of engagement really in a sustainable way, because I think you know, the nature of new curriculum is one of constant innovation and adaptation in a sense, that's one of the key principles in it, so I hope we can find a way of um, facilitating that. Um, I'm being asked by Chris, I think, to confirm um, 
that I think there's a role for cooperative principles in the curriculum. I, you know, just to say before I come to Sarah, the idea of internationalism, of sustainability, of agency, of collaboration, you know, all those things are both the ways in which the curriculum will develop, but also um, some of the purposes of the curriculum in a sense. So I think there's a definite um, there's a definite set of touch points with the kind of things we're discussing today, which um, which I'm very excited about. Uh, Sarah, um, um, I wanted to um, ask you about uh, um, the question that Chris is asking in the chat. Um, is an interesting question, I think, given what we've just been talking about. Uh, Chris is saying, you know, Owen may have, you know, as it were, imposed his values and visions on a community. Um, uh, and that probably is a different model from the way we would regard cooperative development today. Um, so just uh, the question which is being posed is in the in the discussions you've had and in the cooperatives that you've worked with and the communities that you've explored in this way, what what has been the balance in your experience of, I, I, this is my language now, a sort of an individual vision, if you like, on the one hand, perhaps, um, versus on the other, a set of individuals coming together on a kind of bottom-up basis to, to share concerns and possible solutions. What's, you know, in your experience, what has the balance been, if you like? Yeah, um, you know, before uh, entering to this uh, endeavor, the Randworth uh, trip, uh, of course, I had already participated in uh, many research projects, uh, even in collaboration with a property college uh, there in UK. Um, was my idea, my convention before, um, my understanding that uh, a genuine cop would start from the bottom. That for me was kind of a rule um, in my mind. But uh, I had to uh, learn that uh, there are actually uh, multiple ways for a cop to develop and uh, very context dependent. Um, and uh, of course, there are contexts where uh, uh, there is a group that is already visionary and uh, perhaps there is an horizontal leadership already uh, prepared to guide uh, then the broader community towards uh, the formation of a cooperative. Uh, you might have also context, uh, and I'm referring to Rwanda, where uh, cooperatives were set up right after the genocide and was not uh, the best context uh, for a proper genuine uh, cop where perhaps they wouldn't have worked together in a different ethnicity. So if I can, in this all different so a degree of balance between individual leadership and horizontal leadership or total engagement, total bottom-up genuine community endeavor. So in what actually I found as a key factor, uh, and I go back to what we are saying, is uh, education and training. Uh, because even in those cooperatives where it started from uh, outside, the difference then to develop uh, a, a common vision, because then it's fundamental for a cooperative. We all know if there is not a common vision, it's not a cooperative. So that effort to reach that stage and then to work really collectively and cooperatively was reached through proper education and training. So I do think that uh, this is fundamental. So creating then that enabling environment independently of how this uh, um, cooperative project starts. Um, and uh, that, that's why also I think it's so important that uh, you, of course, with the work done uh, in your country, you know, you know better than me, but how it's important to uh, uh, start with the young people. So to expose yeah. them uh, to cooperative values and principles since the very early age, because in this way, you're really preparing then uh, this uh, genuine process uh, of setting up uh, genuine cooperatives. Well, I think that is, that is a good place anyway to, uh, to bring our discussion to a close. I think you've taken us to the heart of the question there, Sarah. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's certainly a question that's dear to my heart personally as well. So um, on behalf of all the, uh, all the um, participants in the discussion more broadly, can I thank our uh, panellists to Liz and to Sean and to Sarah for bringing such a rich set of different perspectives um, to the discussion. I think one of the questions that was being posed in the chat was how do we you know, share some of these materials. And there's a kind of, there's a set of bigger questions about how do we get the balance between our own heritage, our own experience and the Welsh experience within that. And the, you know, the vast array of international experience as well. And I think there is, you know, the, the encouraging thing is that there's a huge amount to draw on um, in that mix, which is, which is fantastic. So thank you to the three contributors for such an enriching discussion. And thank you to ask, for asking me for sharing such a, an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.